So last week we started a new sermon series on marriage, and I introduced you to the four chapters of God's big story. And you can see this image on the screen. Yes. Um, This week we're going to look at the first marriage, which happened in chapter one, which is creation. And next week we're going to look at the first marriage conflict, which happened in chapter two, uh, which we call the fall. Um, And this is the outline for today's sermon. We're going to talk about first point one, God's good creation. And then point two is God invents marriage. And point three is becoming one flesh in marriage. And so before we begin looking at God's word together, um, would you please pray with me? Holy Spirit, please open our hearts and minds to Jesus, the living word. Father, we want to be obedient, joyful, and productive sons and daughters. Please use your word by the power of the Spirit to make us more like Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Everything working okay with the tablets? Are they good? Okay. All right. So point one, God's good creation. Reading Genesis 1 verses 20 and 21. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. I like building things. I like building things with wood. Um, This is a picture of the cabinets that I built in my kitchen. And these are also some of the bookshelves that I have built in my house. And my love of creating and building comes from God. And that's the same for all of you. Because we reflect God's image when we make things. Now, why did I build these bookshelves? I want to hear an answer. Why did I build bookshelves? To organize everything, to store books. Exactly. To, it would be strange if I built all of these cabinets and all of these shelves and they were empty, right? Yeah, it's true. But they, these were built to hold things. They were be, built to be filled with the right kind of things. And when God made the earth and the sea and the sky, they were empty. But we read in verse 20 and 21 how he filled them. He filled them with the right kind of animals. Each plant and animal designed by God for a specific environment. Just like I built some tall shelves for big books and some short shelves for small books. So let's look next to Genesis 1. 22 to 23. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. So God blessed the animals with the power to make more of themselves. And He blesses the animals and the fish and the birds so that they can be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then later he's going to tell Adam and Eve to do the same thing. So how do animals multiply? God put a pattern in creation that requires a male and a female to make babies. And God blessed everything in creation with this ability to multiply themselves generation after generation after generation. And to do that, a male and a female have to come together in a very personal relationship. Now, for animals, it's just a physical relationship. But because human beings have souls, and we are made in God's image, human relationships should be deep connections of heart, soul, and body. Let's look at Genesis 1, 24 to 25. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, 
livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So when God made the fish and the birds and the animals, he made them according to their kinds. You see that verse in in verses 21 and 24, 25. There are cows and horses are different kinds of animals, and dogs are one kind of animal, and cats are another kind of an animal. But two different dogs can make a mixture of themselves, like our dog Roscoe. Um, Roscoe, can you put Roscoe back there, Reed? Thank you. Roscoe is half schnauzer and half poodle. And so Roscoe is a schnoodle. (laughs) But a dog and a cat cannot make a dat, right? No, because they're two different kinds. You see, my friends, God is incredibly creative in the kinds of creatures he made. He made a wide variety of animals, but he also made order and structure and rules for how things work. And that's why in verses 21 and 25, God said that the things he made were good. God made a good world with good environments, full of good food and water and everything needed for life. And God provided good boundaries with laws of physics and biology and morality to govern how all of creation functions. So because God made everything very good, we're a little surprised when we read verse 18. And that's point two, God invents marriage. Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So suddenly in verse 18, something is not good. It is not good that Adam is alone. Now the problem is not Adam's loneliness. The problem is that Adam is not complete to do the task that God had for him. God told Adam to take care of the earth, to name all the animals, and God wanted Adam to fill the earth with more people. But Adam cannot make babies all by himself. (laughs) It is not good for Adam to be alone because God has things for him to do that require a partner. And I know some of you are not married. And maybe you feel alone sometimes. And I want you to know I am not ignoring how you feel. God is not ignoring how you feel. God cares about your loneliness. But God has things for married and single people to do. All of his children are gifted in special ways to bless others and to grow his kingdom. And if you're single, please don't think that getting married is going to bring you complete happiness. Does it work, married people? No. Being single is different. It is difficult, sorry. Being single is difficult because everything is broken. And being married is difficult because everything is broken. (laughs) Everything has been damaged by the fall. Nothing on earth today can bring us full joy and satisfaction of life. We live between the garden and the city. The garden of creation and the city of heaven. Now, married couples with children, without children, married couples who don't have children need to hear this same message because we grieve with you if you cannot have children. Sometimes God blesses infertile couples with adopted children, and that's a beautiful picture of how God adopts us into his household. But there's also this pattern in creation that we understand in our hearts, this pattern of couples who come together in love to create children as images of themselves and to name them. And so when a couple cannot participate in this creation blessing, 
It hurts. And we hurt with them. And so, again, because of the fall uh, in chapter 2 of God's big story, we don't live in the garden. We live between the garden and the city. But because of chapter 3, we have hope, even in this broken world. And we'll talk more about that next week. So for now, let's look more at God's original and very good design for marriage. Genesis 2, 19 and 20. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So Adam is given a big job. God brings all the animals to Adam, and then he watches to see what Adam will call them. And this is another way that human beings are like God, right? God made day and night, and he named them. He made heaven and earth, and he named them. And if you start a new company, you can name it. If you write a book, you can give it a title. And if you have children, you choose their names. And so God is sharing with Adam the responsibility of creating and naming. And I think it's interesting that God gave Adam this job before Eve existed. Yeah? Yalvi thinks that's interesting too. Yeah. (laughs) I think it's interesting. I think Eve would have been a big help. Um, But I think God had a very good reason. And actually, God always has a good reason for what he does, right? (laughs) He does, of course. But when Adam was doing this job, he had to look at each animal and think about the best name for each one. And I think Adam probably noticed something about all these creatures, that each kind of creature came in two types. What do you notice about these pairs of animals? What do you notice? They're different genders, right? That's right. You can tell they're the same species, right? But are they identical? No. No, the male and the female are different. And so God made many different kinds of animals, and each male had a female partner fit for him. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. That's what verse 20 says. Now, this is important. When you read the word helper in verse 20, please remember that God created Eve to be much more than an assistant to Adam. She is a necessary partner. That's what helper means. That's how we should think of our spouse if you are married. Our spouse is a necessary partner. And the Hebrew word helper is used to describe God 16 times in the Old Testament. And God is never our assistant, is he, friends? God is the rescuer, and he is the helper of his people when they are helpless. In Psalm 33, 20, we read, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our helper and our shield. And that is the same Hebrew word for helper that we saw in Genesis 2.20. God is the one who supplies what we do not have. And so God gave Adam to Eve, gave Eve to Adam, because Adam did not have a partner to help him fulfill God's mission. Let's look at Genesis 2.21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Notice that God brought Eve to Adam. God the Father delivers the bride to the groom, just like we do in weddings today. Eve is a gift and a blessing from God to Adam. 
And sometimes in English, we call our spouse our better half. And maybe that phrase comes from this passage of Scripture. But I want to say again to my single friends, you are not half a person without a spouse. You do not have to be married to be a complete and healthy person. Now, the the Hebrew word for ribs in verse 21, it refers to the entire side of Adam, one half of his rib cage. And so a big part of Adam was sacrificed to create Eve. God could have made Eve from the dust like he made Adam, but God decided to remove a piece of Adam and use it to make Eve. And there was a lot of meaning behind this. Um, Look at this quote from Matthew Henry. The woman is not made out of his head to top him, not out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but she is made out of his side to be equal with him and under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be beloved. Isn't that beautiful? That's God's design for marriage. But because of sin, our human relationships are damaged. Husbands and wives compete for power and control. We feel like we are aliens sometimes, battling someone else who is very strange and difficult to live with. And it's helpful in those times to look back at God's design which we can call one flesh marriage. So that's point three, one flesh marriage. Genesis 2.23. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So when Adam was naming the cows and the eagles and the alligators... I think he was probably thinking to himself, that animal has different bones than me, and that animal has different flesh than me. Every animal was different than Adam. But then Adam saw Eve, and he thought, finally, this one has bones like me. She has flesh like me, but she's also different in some pretty awesome ways, too. (laughs) This is a picture of when I first saw Naomi in her wedding dress. (laughs) I look kind of silly, right? But I was amazed at her beauty and her heart. I was so thrilled that God had brought this woman to me. And I think Adam had a face kind of like this maybe (laughs) when he saw Eve, don't you think? I think so. Adam's, so, what, so after Adam gets Eve, Adam's first act of leadership in the marriage is to give Eve a name. And he doesn't name her like the animals. Her name reveals the one flesh connection between Adam and Eve. The Hebrew word for man in verse 23 is ish. And the word for woman is isha. And so this is what makes one flesh marriage so powerful and beautiful, ish and isha. You know, in this church, we're working hard to build loving relationships among people from very different cultures. And this can be hard, but marriage is a great place to learn how to do cross-cultural ministry. Because if you think about it, marriage was the first cross-cultural relationship In history, God made men and women of the same kind, but he gave us significant and wonderful differences. And as the French say, vive la différence. (laughs) Right? Did I say that good? All right, thanks. My friends, sometimes conflict in marriage, sometimes conflict in marriage is the result of wanting the other person to be like us to think like us, to act like us, to live like us, to load the dishwasher the way I do. (laughs) But 
you don't really want to be married to yourself. Adam and Adam would not be able to accomplish the mission that God gave to Adam. Ish needed Isha. And the differences between husband and wife, they can cause friction in our marriages. But that friction is intended to reveal our sin and our selfishness so we can be cured of it. Friction and conflict can be used by God to make us more like Christ when we learn to repent and forgive. You see, God wants us to grow out of our sinful selfishness, to learn to serve others sacrificially as Christ served us. Let's look at how Christ served us. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the gospel, my friends, that God saves sinners through the perfect life and sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And if you believe this gospel truth for you, if you believe that Jesus' sacrifice was for your personal sin, then you will be saved. And receiving that sacrificial love from Jesus is the only way that you and I can do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. It's the only way we can, in humility, count others more significant than ourselves, as verse 3 said. And my friends, did you know that we can make this gospel truth visible to the world? We can do that when we surrender our rights and our preferences for the people we love. When we imitate the sacrificial love that Christ poured out for us, we can help people understand the gospel. Let's look now at our last verse for today together. Genesis 2.24 Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast, or tight, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There is a magnetic attraction between men and women. We have a desire to be reunited as one flesh because God made woman from the flesh of man. But being one flesh is not just about a physical relationship. Um, in English, we sometimes call sex making love. But the act of sex cannot make love, right? Right? Becoming one flesh as husband and wife must happen first in the soul and in the heart. And so unity of soul means that they share the same faith, the same trust in Christ. And that's why God warns Christians only to marry other Christians. If you're not connected at the deepest spiritual level, then it's very hard to connect in heart and body. Unity of heart means that we sacrifice for one another. We listen to one another. We make decisions together. And so when two hearts are deeply united, then physical unity will be the result. In other words, if you want to have a healthy physical relationship in marriage, it will be the result of real heart and soul unity. A good marriage is a triangle of relationships. And we see this same pattern in the Trinity with a loving bond between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
The Son submits to the Father, and the Holy Spirit submits to the Father and the Son. They are all equal in power and majesty and divinity. They choose to relate to each other in these ways as a model for us. In God's marriage design, Adam submits to God and Adam leads his wife in love. A husband who does not lead his wife sacrificially and gently is not submitting to God. But when both the husband and wife are in a strong relationship with God above, then they can repent and forgive and they can love each other as God intended in a one flesh marriage. Now, when that marriage produces children, the parents get the opportunity to help their children establish new triangles of God, husband, and wife. To become one flesh, verse 24 provides an equation with three steps. A plus B equals C. A, a man shall leave his father and mother. B, the man will be united to his wife. And C, they shall become one flesh. So if the man does not detach from his father and mother, he cannot attach to his wife. And I know that in some of your home countries, it is normal for a wife to leave her family and to go and live with her husband's family. And I'm not saying this cultural practice is wrong, but I do wonder if it sometimes makes it harder for the husband to detach from his parents and to attach to his wife. And so I want to ask the men here a question. You ready? If there is a disagreement between your wife and your mother, men, what do you do? Do you support your wife or your mother? Who has your loyalty? You don't have to answer. <laughs> but that's something to think about. There's an African theologian named Onesimus Ngundu from Zimbabwe. And he understands this cultural practice of the wife living with the husband's family. But as a theologian, he recommends that the husband's parents help a new married couple to detach and attach by saying something like this at the wedding. The parents of the groom can say, we publicly declare in your presence our recognition of our son's new relationship with his bride. We joyfully release him to enter into a new husband-wife relationship. That unique and special relationship requires him to leave his father and mother and join to his wife and become one flesh. Therefore, we now publicly release him, and it is not our desire to interfere with the new marriage relationship of this husband and wife. And so I think that could be helpful, maybe. Um, now, even if you don't live with the family of your husband or your family of your wife. I think there's something in this principle that's important for every marriage. Here's the question for all of you. Have we detached from anything that prevents complete attachment to our husband or wife? Is there anything that interferes with becoming one flesh? Ask the Lord to show you what it is so that you can remove that obstacle from your marriage with God's help. Now, next week, we're going to see how Satan tries to break up the triangle of loving relationships between God and Adam and Eve. And Satan does that by making us doubt God's love, getting us to focus on ourselves instead of the people that we love. And that's why we need to pray my friends. Can we pray together now? Father, thank you for the good plan that you made for human beings. I know that many of my friends here feel a long way from the garden, 
and your good plan. Some people here are single and want to be married. Or they're married and they want to have children. Or they are in a marriage that is really hard and they don't see how it can get better. Thank you, Lord, for being father to the fatherless. You set the lonely in families. Help our church family to be a source of peace and hope and growth for each of us as we live together in this broken world. Would you use us for your glory in all that we do? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.